Welcome into the 219th episode of the Young Terps podcast from the Viner Four Gates studio. This is your host, Mason Viner, and today he's back for a full episode this time, my man Todd Carton. But Todd, um, as always, I guess we'll kick it off with the non-rev report. All right, Mason. Well, it could be a pretty short non-rev report uh, this week, given that basically we're going to, well, we can sum up maybe the volleyball season and talk a little bit about, uh, talk about women's basketball, but otherwise, uh, men's and women's soccer are done for the year. Wrestling hasn't, doesn't have a meet until a week from, uh, well, roughly, roughly a week from when we're recording this, I think on the 11th. And gymnastics doesn't start till after the first of the year. So there you go. Yeah, so that just takes us straight on to the Terps uh, volleyball team. Uh, disappointing year for the Terps on the court. They finished the season splitting their final two matches, uh, losing three sets to one to number 19 Purdue, and uh, getting a bit of payback against the Steve Air coached uh, Indiana Hoosiers, uh, really ending their season with a 3-2 to two win. Uh, that was the Friday after Thanksgiving. And, well, Todd, this one's done, too, now. Maryland finishes uh, at the 500 mark, 16-16 and 16 on the season, 7-13 and 13 in conference play. And it's hard to say it's anything but disappointing. Yeah, I think so, Mason. I, I look at it that way just because uh, Maryland – as they did last year, this year's non-conference schedule was marginally better than last year's as things turned out. Uh, the, they thought We thought going in it would be a little stronger than it was, but it was a relatively easy non-conference schedule that they should have gone through with no more than a single loss, and they lost three times. Uh, they had a favorable conference schedule in a year when the conference was not quite as overpowering, very strong at the top, but the middle of the conference was very well balanced. And, uh, you know, only six teams which made the NCAA field, although five passed through to the Sweet 16. Um, but only nine of Maryland's 20 conference games came against the top part of the league, the, the six teams that made the tournament. So Maryland had its opportunities. Um, they just couldn't, they were inconsistent and couldn't convert. They had a couple of big wins and, uh, but they couldn't develop any consistency. Yeah, and it just results in another year where the Terps miss the NCAA tournament. Uh, despite those big wins, Todd, that they had, Purdue and Ohio State, uh, winning games on the road, but consistency lacking throughout the year. Yeah, they had, again, they had a, a part of the schedule against Michigan State and uh, Northwestern and Indiana and Michigan. Uh, you know, these are teams that were slightly above or somewhat below Maryland and RPI. They finished that stretch two and seven. They could have just as easily, if they had played to the level they played in their upset wins, if they had maintained that level throughout the year, they probably would have gone through that stretch at, at six and three or maybe even seven and two and would have walked into the NCAA tournament with an ele had they been able to build an 11 and nine conference record. Instead, the Terps two and seven in that stretch, and uh, it results in again a uh, underperforming year for Maryland. Todd, uh, some news out of the transfer portal that's not too good for the Terps as well. Yeah, I I learned from a very very reliable source and trustworthy uh, yesterday at the uh, women's basketball game that Milango Million Maryland star libero has uh, placed her name in the transfer portal. And right now, um, she, I think, wants to stay in the Big Ten, but I, I, I won't go into the, the reasons for her leaving. They were explained to me, but uh, I'll treat that as kind of confidential. Uh, she does want to stay in the Big Ten, so um, I'm going to guess that um, Minnesota is probably the leader in the clubhouse right now because their libero, uh, C.C. McGraw, I think has used up her eligibility, although the COVID thing drives me a little crazy. Uh, but but their coach has uh, not not re retired or resigned. He's moving up into a different position in the athletic department. So they need to replace the coach. So that'll probably be the ultimate determining factor for Milan. But she'll be a big loss 
for Adam Hughes to replace, and uh, he better be looking really hard. Yeah, and, and you know he will. The Terps always active on the volleyball recruiting scene. Um, and that kind of wraps up our volleyball coverage. Obviously, as things progress in the portal, we'll keep you posted here on the podcast. Uh, Todd, teams that are uh, inconsistent, let's take a look at one of our own. Uh, women's basketball for the Terps. Uh, I have no idea how to describe it at this point. Two and one in the Thanksgiving weekend stretch. Uh, that lost to DePaul. They followed with a close win over Towson and a win over Pitt. Uh, and then, you know, they flipped the script with a win over number seven Notre Dame, but back at it again uh, yesterday, a 90 to 67 loss to Nebraska. Yeah, I just, again, the, the, the whole notion of inconsistency and. It's really interesting to me, Mason, in some ways to compare the women's team with the men's team and sort of what Kevin Willard has managed to do with his transfers and his experience. And frankly, the women's team brought in a lot of experience. Abby Myers is a grad student. Elisa Pinzon is a grad student. Uh, Renee Alexander and Lavender Briggs are both upper class men. So it doesn't seem like it should be taking them this long to get their act together. Um, but, uh, you know, what the way they played Sunday against Nebraska, it was almost as though they thought all they needed to do was show up after their win, big win at Notre Dame. They've won at Baylor and at Notre Dame, so they have two top 20 wins on the road. And Nebraska's a decent team. They were ranked preseason. Uh, they, they lost a couple of games early, and so they've fallen out of those rankings. But, um, you know, it's just a good team is going to come back with some pride. And Nebraska had the same night that Maryland was beating Notre Dame. Nebraska was getting run out of Castle Coliseum down in Blacksburg by Virginia Tech. So you knew they were going to come in highly motivated. And they did everything right. And Maryland did everything wrong, pretty much. Yeah, and the road in Big Ten play continues for the Terps. Uh, they travel to Purdue Thursday night. Uh, on BTN. Todd, uh, you have it in your notes. You're not going to guarantee a win, but I think we can expect a bounce back performance from the Terps. Yeah, again, I, it's it's the, the, the notion of a team, a quality team with driven players will take a loss like that, like the Maryland had to Nebraska or that Nebraska had to um, uh, Virginia Tech or even that Notre Dame had to Maryland because Notre Dame came back and, and upset UConn last Sunday. So they'll take that to heart. They'll play better. Purdue is certainly a winnable game. They're probably a little less talented than Nebraska. But, you know, um, Nebraska certainly gave everybody a roadmap of how to attack Maryland. Yeah, and then the Terps, uh, their next opponent after Purdue will certainly find that roadmap and that is none other than the UConn Huskies, who Maryland will play Sunday at 3 on ABC. Correct. So, uh, big game for the Terps in Xfinity again. Uh, hopefully they get a nice crowd out there going up against the NFL, but no commanders uh, came this weekend. So, hopefully people well, head out to College Park and support the Terps. Let's hope so. I mean, they can certainly use the energy. That was certainly lacking yesterday as well. I think maybe – people were a little spent from the big game Friday night. Yeah, and that is something that we'll get to. But, Todd, let's hit on football. We haven't had a podcast since the Terps wrapped up uh, what is a 7-5 and five season with a 37 to nothing beatdown against Rutgers. Now Maryland off to the Dukes Mayo Bowl uh, where they'll take on the ranked NC State Wolfpack. Todd's, uh, your thoughts on, on Maryland's win over Rutgers and where they fall uh, in the grand scheme of things at 7-5. and five. Well, the, the first thing was is that, you know, I mean, it, I, it was another one of those games where I'm not sure how involved Rutgers was really in playing the game. Maryland took advantage. Maryland was at home. The Terps played well. We had another scare with uh, Talia uh, going down for a couple of plays uh, at the end of the half. But uh, they, the, the Terps made every play they needed to make in that game, and certainly earned their bowl win. You know, it's a step in the right direction, seven and five, four wins in conference, I think for the first time since uh, joining the Big Ten. So that's another step in the right direction and a win over NC State. If they can pull that off, 
down in Charlotte uh, a couple of days before the turn of the year would be uh, just an indication that the program is seems to be moving in the right direction. But they lose a lot as well. You know, we have a, a bunch of guys who have uh, Deontay Banks today announced that he'll be foregoing the the bowl game and and uh, entering his name in the N NFL draft as well as some of the top receivers who have already uh, announced. And of course, uh, CJ Dupree is unlikely to travel with the team since he has also entered the portal. Yeah, we'll see on CJ Dupree, hearing a lot of conflicting things on that, but we're going to do a, a little bit more in-depth dive into the transfer portal and the Terps' needs. Uh, I did a show last night inside the bag with Ahmed Gafir, uh, where we covered that in depth, and hopefully Ahmed will join us later this week uh, on the pod to go over uh, the Terps and hit on the players that have entered the portal. Yeah, for me, it's um, a step in the right direction. It really wasn't what I hoped for, Todd. I know you and I have talked about this at the games, uh, after them, and here on the podcast. You would have just loved to see Maryland pull off one more win out of it to get to that 8-4 and four mark, whether it was that Purdue game, uh, a better performance against what well, Wisconsin or Penn State. But you just feel like... Um, they left something on the table this year. I can't argue too hard hard with you on, on that, Mason, because certainly the Purdue game was winnable, and and there's a lot of there's some controversy, of course, over a couple of officiating calls and the way they put, were able to compete with Ohio State and Michigan. Uh, again, games that I I, I sat down and uh, before the. Big Ten championship game, and I looked at Michigan playing Purdue, and I thought back on reflected on Maryland season and thinking that, but for the want of three or four plays by the Terps, you know, they could have won all three of the, those games that they threw, or those three games that they lost. The two games where they laid an egg, I think, left a very sour taste in everyone's mouth. But those three games, Maryland was in them a couple, a play here and there, a call here and there. Uh, and those games could turn around and you're you could be looking at instead of seven and five, you could be looking at something more on the lines of 10 and two or nine and three. And I think when Maryland started six and two, everybody's got their hopes up a little more. And then, of course, they come back and lay those two really uh, terrible games on, on the road at Wisconsin and in Happy Valley. Yeah. And, and that's the difference. And, and Wayne, who's joined us throughout the year on the podcast, is away from the mic tonight. <laughs> Um, I think he really said it. If you look at what's gone on in co in college football this year, and and yeah, we're getting kind of out there in in ideas. Is the opportunity that Maryland had this year that they just seemed to fumble? TCU yeah, is you in know, the college football playoff. You know, ten and two yeah. teams are the fifth and sixth ranked teams in the country this year. And at one point, I think you could look at this season. Going back to the Purdue game, you know, you lose to Michigan by seven on the road, fine. And just say if they win that game against Purdue, they're seven and one going into Wisconsin. And opportunity is all there. And the and the team that we saw at times this year, if they just had one more play in them at certain points, would have been solidly in the playoff discussion uh, on Sunday. Actually would have been there. And I know it sounds completely crazy to talk about a seven and five team, but the combined points that they lost by and the way that they just kind of folded when they really needed to stand up and punch back, I think really leaves a sour taste in those who really follow this team's um, journey because the talent was certainly there to really do something big this year. And other than I really would say, other than that Ohio State game, the passing attack was never what it was supposed to be. It wasn't, and I think a lot of that falls on the offensive line. I don't think the offensive line performed to the level that people expected Maryland would, would have in the, you know, coming into the season. Um, I don't know if it also falls on some of the early season play calling and some of the decisions in terms of utilizing personnel. Um, you know, Talia, Talia has some limitations. He's broken all kinds, set up just about every record of Maryland passing that you can imagine. But he does have some limitations, his size being one, uh, his, his ability to make a quick decision uh, on long developing plays. And that's complicated by the struggles of the offensive line. So 
you know, I, I think coming in, I secret to the season, I secretly hoped that this would be sort of Maryland's year of, that Michigan State had last year, where they really surprised a lot of people. And, and uh, Mel Tucker brought in lots of transfers who all worked well. And, you know, then they fell back to earth somewhat this year. So, you know, but, but I think those big losses stung more and took some of the shine off the season more. You know, I mean, if you think about had Maryland been competitive in the two games that they lost, the Penn State and Wisconsin, and still finished seven and five, I still think we'd feel better about that seven and five season. I would agree. I'll take one of them. I'll take the Penn State game. Well, because of course. the score of the Wisconsin game, if you look back on it in the record books, will, that would be fine, in my opinion. 23 to yeah. 10. But a 30 to 0 beatdown is, is not what you want to see when it comes back to that. And that makes you question where the program is as a whole. Overall, though, look, here's how we'll look at it. And it's a great lead up to uh, our sponsor, DraftKings. The win total was 5.5. We won 7. We have a chance at 8. I'll take it. I, I don't really like the way it happened. But the end result, again, when you look back in the history of the record books, Unless this team is crazy talented with NFL players, which is completely possible, I think it will be looked at as either a season on the brink where Maryland's really about to make a jump and, and be consistently a bowl team and maybe win more than seven games next year and the year after, or it will be looked at as a season of lost opportunity in, in Loxley's career. I don't really see there being much of a middle ground. Maybe, maybe not, and, and I know you, you want to talk a little bit about DraftKings, but before you do, I, I just have to say that as you were talking about, you know, these, these sort of missed opportunities, I thought, didn't I just say that about the volleyball team too? Yeah, you did. I, I almost felt like you were talking about the volleyball team with the football team. A play here, a play there, a call here, a call there, and, and the season looks very different for both of those teams. And I, and I just think it's crazy. And we're talking about this before the bowl game, and it's almost exactly what Locks is saying. You know, everybody leaves the transfer portal now. It's basically the end of the season. And unless you're playing that playoff game, your bowl game is the start of the next one. Is just the amount of games that have been really um, affected. And, yeah, volleyball is the exact same, basically sitting in the exact same spot. It was even a worse swing for them, in my opinion, though. Is... You just, you know, the whole season was in a handful of plays. The difference between nine and three and seven and five in college football is like a, almost like a gap like none other in sports. It's an absolutely crazy uh, just thing. Like if you saw a nine and three Maryland football team where our team's ranked, and look, the realistic part of it is we could be playing in the Rose Bowl if we were nine and three, depending on which games you win and which games you lose because I know it would have knocked some other teams out the way you look at it. Instead, right. and, we're in the Dukes-Mayo we Bowl, we... and we're looking at the season, and you and I are having a conversation like this for the masses to listen to, talking about disappointment with Maryland football in the Big Ten at 7-5. and five. Yeah, that's crazy. That, that, that feels a, li a little crazy. So that shows, again, your season on the brink, and whether the brink brings elevation or a plummeting, is what really remains to be seen as we go forward into, as Lo as you say, Loxley calls it the beginning of the next season, but it still counts for this season. So for those who took the over five and a half, they're going, they, they have the potential to go way over. Hey, well, that's already hit for them. And you can do something similar today on the DraftKings Sportsbook. We've partnered with DraftKings here on the Young Terps podcast and Todd, the only thing better than football Sundays or Saturdays, or I guess we're hitting towards bowl season, so football almost every day, is DraftKings. Uh, the official sports betting partner of the NFL is sharing an unbelievable new deal with customers. You can get $150 in free bets, all with our promo code YOUNGTERPS. All you need to do is bet at least $5 on any pregame money line wager. And if your bet hits, or if it doesn't even right now still in Maryland, you get $150 in free bets. You heard that right. That's $150 in free bets today with DraftKings. That is now live in Maryland, D.C., and Virginia, as well as other states throughout the country. 
Download the DraftKings Sportsbook today. New customers use promo code YOUNGTERPS. Bet $5 on any pregame money line and get $150 in free bets. That's promo code YOUNGTERPS only at DraftKings Sportsbook, the official betting partner of the NFL. And as always, please play responsibly for help. Visit mdgamblinghelp.org or call 1-800-GAMBLER. 21 and over, physically present in Maryland, D.C., or Virginia. Eligibility restrictions apply, subject to regulatory licensing requirements. See DraftKings.com backslash MD for full terms and condition. One per customer. Bonuses issued as free bets. No purchase necessary for this sweepstakes. And DraftKings is allowed to operate in Maryland. And again, see terms at DKNG.com backslash MD. Todd, let's head over to basketball where the Terps, well, they were a two-point favorite on a Friday night, and uh, that was just about right for Maryland in their win over Illinois. Were you using the DraftKings uh, app to to chart that favorite? Oh, I did, and I played the Terps on the DraftKings <laughs> app on Friday night, and I left uh, Xfinity Center with a little bit more of a smile on my face. Uh, nice little I, – I didn't play them on the spread, Todd. I, I wasn't I wasn't willing to risk that one. I thought I thought the money line looked a little bit better for Maryland because you know it's Maryland. It's a big game. It's always going to come down to the last play, and well, it just about did that with Jameer Young's three. Yeah, how how exciting was that, uh, Mason? You know, to see it, it it echoed a little bit uh, Anthony Cowan and Melo Trimble for me. You know, had echoes of that making a late three where a guy wearing number one for Maryland making a late three, but, you know, it's one of the things that kind of jumped out to me on reflection after that game was the contribution of Juju Reese. And he didn't do much in terms of the box score. You know, I had two or four points or something like that, missed some free throws, but he got a tremendous rebound late in the first half uh, that led to an open three. And at the end of the game, he, again, got a, a key offensive rebound, and he set the screen that created the space for Jameer Young, who is nothing but a ball player, um, to hit his big shot. Well, I wanted to keep this away uh, a little bit away from, I guess, coaching philosophy discussions, but I think that there's no place where it's showing better for Maryland the change. I, I'm going to say just in tone and style that Willard has brought to the program then when you see a guy like Julian Reese put up a stat line of 29 minutes, uh, five points and seven boards, that he's still in the game. And while it wasn't really pretty from Julian Reese, Todd, I agree with you. The change that you can just see in the approach of these guys that aren't having the best game, the way they stick with it is something that we've been missing in College Park. Yeah, and I think that it's that is in part philosoph philosophical because Willard has said it uh, on a number of occasions that he's never going to take a guy out as long as he's playing hard for, he's never going to take a guy out for taking a bad shot. And he said, that's why my offense looks ugly. Sometimes I, I let try to give the guy some freedom, but as long as they're working hard on defense and rebounding and doing the little things, I'm not going to pull them from the game. So I think the players feel a bit freer in terms of what they can do. And, and honestly, you know, I don't know whether it's uh, Willard, whether it's philosophical, whether it's Bill Meyer, but I was talking with our buddy Bruce Posner uh, recently about this, and I said, think about the four key players from last year's team who came back, right, which are Juju Reese, Hakeem Hart, Dante Scott, and Ian Martinez. Tell me which one is not noticeably better this year. No, oh, well, none of them. I mean, they've all gotten so much better that that none of them are noticeably not better. I mean, they're all playing at such – I think it's really pace, Todd. And I know you and I have had this discussion off the air before. The The speed of the game seems to be benefiting these guys. The way they play with an attacking mindset seems to be benefiting them, I think, a lot, um, both mentally and the product that's on the court. I think I think so too, and and again, you know, I think uh, the the notion that you get rewarded for, as long as you play hard and you execute, you're going to get rewarded with playing time, and and 
you know, I mean, even even a guy like Don Carey, who was one of Willard's transfers, and and that's another thing that he hit the portal, but he had a notion of who did he want to bring in. He wanted guys, and he said it, that were complementary to the players. He didn't want players who duplicated what he already had on his roster. So he has a plan. He has a vision. But he talked about a guy like Don Carey, and he said, yeah, he's not lighting it up, and particularly at home, but he does all the little things that I ask him to do. And he so he gets his playing time. He does. And just running through some of the numbers for the Terps, uh, two players led Maryland in minutes in this game, and it was Jameer Young and Hakeem Hart. Both players played 34 minutes uh, on the night, and they were the two highest producing Terps on the offensive end. Jameer Young shoots 9 for 20, 4 for 9 from 3. Two for two from the free throw line. That results in 24 points and four boards for the, I guess, transfer hero of Maryland basketball this year, Jameer Young. Hakeem Hart shoots six for nine in the game. Five for six from three. 17 points for Hakeem. Five boards. Uh, Maryland also big contributions from Donta Scott, who had 12 points and three boards. Uh, and then just a grab bag of guys. But the player that I, I would focus my most amount of improvement and and time on in this one was the play of Ian Martinez Friday night, Todd. Not just Friday night. I You've seen this growth from, from almost from the beginning of the year, and the more he plays, the better he gets. He seems to be the more confidence he seems to play with. And, you know, that's a confidence is a dangerous thing. It is, especially with a player that can get up and down the way Martinez can. I think this offense favors him a lot more, and the fact that on defense, he's the closest thing to a stopper that I've seen at Maryland for a while. I mean, Daryl Morceau was a great defensive player, but Martinez from a guard position is just some is a guy that you can just look to on the bench, and if they want to press, he's the perfect player to do it. If they want to push the pace, he's amazingly athletic on the court and is the guy that I think Maryland fans thought they were getting last year that was a big get out of the portal. Yeah, absolutely. And and when you talk about Martinez and, and Daryl Morcel, I, I mean, Martinez is just so much more athletic than Daryl. And, and no knock on Daryl Morcel. He was the glue guy. He was the heart and soul of the team for a couple of years. Um, but Martinez just is a much more athletic kind of a guy. And, and that can make him much more disruptive. Yeah, on the Illinois side, Todd, um, I mean, Coleman Hawkins had a great game. Uh, Terrence Shannon Jr. was the leading scorer for Illinois. He put up 19 points in the game. But the, the one stat that jumped off the sheet to me was you know, the leading scorer for the Illini was 0 for 5 from 3. The second leading scorer was 2 for 6 from 3. As a team, Illinois shoots a awful 5 for 20 from three-point line. They did not have a good shooting night as really as a whole. They shoot 44%, 27 for 61, uh, 5 for 20 from three, 7 from 8 from the free throw line. Uh, in comparison to Maryland, who overall shot the ball 24 for 54, that's 44%, uh, 9 for 23 from three, so almost 40% from three, and 14 for 18 from the line. So the Terps shoot overall 10 more free throws than Illinois, and they come away with the 71 to 66 win. Uh, anything else that stuck out from you? Uh, you were you you said something before that that uh, that I was going to react to, and being an old guy, you know, I have these these intellectual moments where I think of something and it goes in one half of my head and out the other before it can come out my mouth. But um, you know, I, I I just think that oh, when you were talking about the a the three point shooting of uh, Illinois, I think you, if you look across Maryland's games, they've been really, really strong defending the three. And I think part of that is, again, you talked about pace and these guys recover when there's a drive and they're collapsing the defense, they recover out and they cover for teammates at a pace that's just uh, remarkable. And I think so that, so that it, Teams aren't getting great open looks. They'll get a couple during the game. Every everybody gets them, but they're they're getting a lot of contested threes, and that's always going to lower your percentage. And then you mentioned Coleman Hawkins. You know that guy. That guy is just. I I only. It's a small sample for me because I hadn't seen Illinois play before. 
but to me, that guy only showed one weakness in his game, and that was trying to shoot on the move. If he was moving, his shot was not very good. But if he had his feet set, and in every other aspect of his game, he's he's just a nightmare. 6'10", handles the ball. You can't press him because he if he handles the ball, he can go over the press. He can catch the ball over the press. Really, really uh, just a phenomenal. I, I was tremendously impressed with Coleman Hawkins, but also with the grit and effort of a Maryland squad that's now going to go into Wisconsin in a couple of days and face another challenge. Yeah, they are. The player that I thought uh, I was really excited to watch was Sky Clark, uh, the point guard for Illinois. Almost a five-star, was rated a five-star at one point, uh, was rumored to land at Kentucky, verbal to Kentucky, ends up at Illinois, and he just didn't really have a great game. He hasn't really had that great of a year at this point. 31 minutes for him. Two for five for six points, um, two assists, three boards. I was really excited to watch him play. He, it didn't really amount to much, but uh, I, I kind of left. I left the building with with an excitement for Maryland basketball that I've really haven't felt in, in a while. Probably since the Terps run with Mellow Trimble and Diamond Stone. Even then, Todd, I, I guess maybe you can explain it being around this program longer, but. It really feels like they're playing that Gary Williamson-inspired basketball that just brings the heart out of the building and brings, brings I guess, nostalgia to the Maryland fans. Um, nostalgia and energy, Mason. You know, again, it's it's that pace of play that you're talking about. And 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 people, it's, it's an enjoyable brand of basketball to watch. You know, win, lose blow out a team, be competitive, whatever, whatever. It's an enjoyable brand of basketball to watch. Yeah. And, and I I can agree with that. You know, they shoot a lot of threes. As you said, they defend the three. Well, they push the pace. uh, Even when sometimes I think that the more um, basketball coaching mind of, of that I have would say they need to slow it down for a little bit. They just push the pace and they get to the hoop and they score, they draw fouls. Um, it, it is a great time, and you know, sixteen thousand three eighty was the announced attendance. I think that was about the number of people that were in the building on Friday night. This team is, is one to see if you're a Maryland basketball fan, especially one that kind of checked out in the Mark Turgeon years. As especially that, um, it's it's just a completely different group, and you know, you love you love what Cal- Kevin Willard has brought. I was not. I'll be the first to admit it. I was not thrilled. With the hire, uh, when when they brought him on, but since he's arrived, he's done everything right. He's clearly moved my needle. You know, I'm not bought quite into the hype, but I think Maryland cracked the top ten on uh, uh, a couple of uh, ranking lists. The number thirteen, I think, in the AP this week. Yes. Um, yep. They are. You know, uh, I, you know, I may not be quite bought into all of that hype yet. Let's see. They go on on the road to play a, a tough Wisconsin team. Uh, Wisconsin, the Cole Center, is always a tough place to win uh, and play. Uh, so we'll see how how that goes. And then, of course, they have another back to set of back to back huge tests against uh, Tennessee and UCLA. UCLA being their next home game. So there's a, there's a lot in front of Maryland. And we'll see if they can live up to the hype. Fortunately, again, he's got a mature team. So we can hope that they're not buying into the hype quite so much and that he's keeping them grounded, he and his staff, Willard and his staff. Yeah, Wisconsin comes into the game, Todd, 6-2 and two on the year. Uh, wins over South Dakota, Stanford, Green Bay, Dayton, USC, and most recently a overtime win over their rivals, Marquette losses on the year come with a one point loss to the Kansas Jayhawks and a loss in the ACC Big Ten Challenge at home to Wake Forest. Uh, Led in scoring by Tyler Wall and Chucky Hepburn. Uh, Classic Wisconsin team as far as I can see uh, and and from seeing them play a little bit of that game against Kansas and the game against Marquette. Um, Not really much that concerns me. I actually think Maryland should win this game. I will uh, take a moment to check the odds on the DraftKings Sportsbook. But I can't imagine Maryland's favored. 
But, hey, you know what I love to see, Todd? No Brad Davidson on this list of uh, Wisconsin statistics that I'm looking at from uh, uwbadgers.com right now. Yeah, you know, Mason, I was kind of wondering whether he was going to get his 15th year or not. It, it certainly uh, would feel like year 15. Yeah, I know. It, it just it, – it really would. It felt like Brad Davidson was around just forever, forever, forever um, there. You know um, – as I said, it's it's not uh, an easy win for Maryland. I don't think you can take this game lightly. I, I believe we can watch it on ESPN too, and you know I'm sure DraftKings will give you the the, the line on the game, and we'll see whether Maryland is uh, favored or not. You know, and Todd, I just found it on the DraftKings app. I had to search for it. You know, scrolling through all the basketball games that they have uh, lines on between now and tomorrow. It's pick 'em. Uh, even spread against the money line, since it's, since it is that uh, both teams uh, minus one ten on that over under at one twenty nine and a half, which is also at um, minus one ten. So bet one hundred ten to win one hundred uh, on all of those odds that you can find on the DraftKings sportsbook. So you know, I I actually think Pickham's probably where it should be. Yeah, you know, you could be right. I mean, Maryland, again, they're getting a lot of buzz. So uh, people are go- are going to be leaning toward Maryland, and, and Maryland's getting a lot of attention. I think that you mentioned the player who's probably going to be the, the key to this game and who Maryland's going to have to control a lot, which is uh, – and that's Tyler Wall. Uh, you know, 6'9", um, just one of those guys, you know, 6'9", and what he probably scores about – 12, 15 points a game, pulls down 8, 10 rebounds a game. (coughs) So, you know, and again, you know, Maryland is a little size challenge. So what you want to do is probably run them as much as you can. And, um, you know, Wall, I think he's there, both their leading scorer and uh, rebounder. Yeah, yes, he is. So, you know, and um, we'll see. Uh, Chucky Hepburn, I guess, is there, uh, or Stephen Crowell, there, they kind of share point guard duties for the Badgers. Um, you know, that's one thing that those teams are going to do. They'll protect the ball. They don't turn it over a lot. They're very methodical. You know, they, they only score 60 points a game, 65, 66 points a game. So... Uh, and and it's a it, it is a short rotation, so that could advantage Maryland. He's basically uh, playing a, a, a pretty much. It looks to me, I'm looking at some stats on ESPN. Pretty much a six man rotation. Uh, we have one, two, three, four guys getting thirty plus minutes a game. Yeah, and that's what I was just going to point out, Todd. Is it's four guys who get more than thirty minutes a game. The bench is it is short. You know, outside of that, they have only. One player, I guess, outside of the starting five that is averaging, you know, anywhere kind of close to 20 minutes, which is Carter Gilmore. And it doesn't look like there's a lot of depth there. Wisconsin receiving votes in the polls. So if you go on like a UM Terps, you see the RV next to Wisconsin. They're receiving votes right now in the poll, only a handful of them. But, you know, the more and more we talk about it, I I seeming – I seem to like Maryland's matchup here. You know, a team that gets up and down like Maryland that can get you into foul trouble from driving the bucket is is going to be tough for a for a Wisconsin team that wants to take the air out of the ball. It's kind of it's going to be whoever dictates the tempo of the game. The Badgers did just show in back to back games that they can compete in in a little bit higher scoring games. The seventy eight seventy five loss to Wake and the eighty to seventy seven win at Marquette. So they can play that, but if you look at the results. You know, a 60 to 50 win against Stanford, a 43 42 win against Dayton, the one point loss, 69 to 68 to Kansas. Uh, In overtime. Yeah, and you see a team that plays Greg Gard, Wisconsin basketball. They want to take the air out of the ball, slow the game down, grind grind it out down low, and uh, play through their top tier guys, which we've seen with like Reavers over the years and going back to the uh, Bo Ryan days, you know, your Nigel Hayes players they have like a handful of guys that can really play in and a rotation that's probably going to be ready to go come you know january february 
uh, around that. So I think the Terps are catching them as far as going on a road game at the right time. I mentioned this on the post-game show uh, from Friday night. Tickets, Todd, $4 with no fees uh, on on the third-party site. So not a lot of excitement. Not a lot of excitement around this one in Wisconsin. Yeah, I'm. It's funny, Mason, because because I'm looking at at ESPN's website and it has a, a link that has tickets as low as two dollars. Yeah, so you you can imagine not not too much excitement up, up so, in. So you're up hoping that maybe it's a little more right. So you can hope that it's a little bit more of a neutral uh, atmosphere, maybe. You know, more akin to a Maryland Coffin State. <laughs> I mean, that's that's what you would hope for. And, you know, for, for those of you who like to harp on Maryland for their attendance, the number 13 team in the country is playing at Wisconsin, and tickets are $2. So th- I don't think you can kind of do this podcast without, without saying that. It, it is a spot where, yeah, you're, you're right. I'm hoping for a more neutral environment, and uh, I'll go ahead and pick it. I think uh, Maryland wins this one 75-65, uh, adding another big win, another quad one win uh, that hopefully stays that way by the end of the year to their resume. Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave the picking to you, Mason, as I always try to avoid doing with uh, Bruce. And, you know, as, as tempting as some of the, the offers on DraftKings are, I never bet on the teams that I root for. Yeah, I try and stay with it, away from it, even though it did reward me on Friday night. I do always try and stay stay away from it. Uh, we will be back on the pod uh, later this week, breaking down the Terps' uh, hopeful win over Wisconsin and the upcoming games against the Tennessee Volunteers and the UCLA Bruins. So Terps with two big ones coming up. As always, I'd like to thank Viner Four Gates for uh, sponsoring us here. High above Rockville Pike is, is where I'm sitting recording the show and our friends over at DraftKings. And you, Todd, for joining me on the show. Always a pleasure, Mason. And that'll wrap it up here on the Young Terps podcast. As always, give us a follow on Twitter at YoungTerp1. And thanks for listening.